afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Matt Jacobs, director of the Bob Graham Center for Public Service. It's great to all have you all here today on a beautiful afternoon. Uh, I, I'm going to introduce somebody here in a moment who's from uh, Canada, and I'm from upstate New York originally, about 30 hours south of the Canadian border, so it's nice to have some nice weather uh, this time of year. Um, so uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon's inaugural Business Journalist in Residence program, exploring the ways in which AI is transforming business. I want to start by uh, thanking some of our partners, also recognizing some distinguished guests. Former U.S. President Kent Fox is here. Welcome, Kent. Great to have you here. Uh, we also have members of the uh, Office of Strategic Communications, who's one of the partner uh, units on this, Warrington College of Business. We'd like to thank them. The College of Journalism and Communications, uh, as well as a partner on this. And as always, I'd like to thank the team here at the Graham Center and UF Video Services for their work uh, putting this together. Uh, it's great to work with a wonderful team uh, across this campus to be able to put events like this on, and, and it's a real pleasure. Um, we do have a couple of housekeeping items before uh, we get into the substance of the program. We will have a Q&A following the, the presentations, the panel presentation. So please have your questions ready. For those of you uh, joining remotely, welcome. We're delighted to have you here, whether you're here physically inside Pew Hall or remotely inside Pew Hall. Uh, those of you who are remote, you will be able to ask your questions through the comment bubble in the lower right of your screen. We will be able to ask those questions uh, here in the, in the, the Okora to, to make sure those get answered and addressed. Let me turn now to the substance of today's event. How AI is Transforming Business. We here at the Graham Center are always encouraging people to think about civic engagement, public leadership, public policy, and public service very broadly. In this context, the evolution and ever-deepening impact of artificial intelligence in our lives, in both positive and negative ways, is a critical issue impacting how we engage, lead, and serve, regardless of whether that is in the private, nonprofit, or public sectors. And when we think of business, whether it be the business of developing and advancing AI or the business of utilizing AI, it will be increasingly critical to how we conceive of civic engagement, public leadership, public policy, and public service moving forward. You need look no further than the news uh, articles of, of this past week about AI created videos and a bunch of other things in, in the public space uh, to demonstrate that point. I don't expect that today these issues will be a driving uh, aspect of the conversation. This is focused on AI and how it's changing business. But it does help explain why we here at the Graham Center were so excited to partner on this event, because we do think no matter where you are coming from, where you're going, what sector you might be working in, you need to be thinking about engagement, leadership, and service. And if you're in the private sector and you're not thinking about how your business engages, leads, and serves in its community, you might not be in the private sector for very long either. Um, I also hope you'll keep some of those thoughts in the back of your mind as you do listen to today's program because, again, I think it can help us understand why we all need to be thinking about AI no matter what our position in our communities. Let me now introduce the moderator for today's event. Brett Posner Ferdman is a fourth year undergraduate student at the University of Florida, pursuing a dual degree in political science and journalism. A Canadian native, welcome to the South, uh, Brett. Uh, since 20, September 23, uh, Brett has worked as a research and data analyst, intern for the US Consulate General in Toronto, where he specializes in political mapping and issue polling. Brett has also previously worked as an intern for CNN's editorial team, The Row, in Washington, DC, and since 2021 has served as a researcher and data analyst for the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information. The Breckner Center, if you're unfamiliar with it, focuses on the advancement of First Amendment rights and government transparency. His journalistic work includes partnering with Pulitzer Prize winner Sarah Gainham to expose the use of gag orders as part of university Title IX investigations across the country. And that story was published as a special report for USA Today. Please join me in welcoming Brett. Thank you, everyone. And once again, I want to thank the Bob Graham Center for hosting this incredible event. It is an honor to be here. 
and I think we covered a lot of the stuff I wanted to. So with that out of the way, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our incredible speakers today. So first, we have Jess Jang. She is this semester's business and journalist in residence. She earned a degree in economics and environmental studies at Yale University and is the senior supervising editor of, of NPR's Planet Money podcast, uh, which focuses on economics. In 2014, she was also part of the team that won an Emmy Award for documenting the mind-blowing scope and human impact of globalization through the process of creating their own t-shirt. So everyone, please give her a big welcome. Next, I want to introduce Jim Hoover. He is a clinical professor at the Warrington College of Business here at the University of Florida. His research is focused on the integration of artificial intelligence into business, as well as data privacy concerns. <laughs> Finally, I want to introduce Sri Kali, Rama, Kali Anna Raman. Uh, he's a professor of journalism at the CJC and is the director of the Media Effects and Technology Lab, which focuses on the intersection of media, technology, and psychology. He is also the co-founder of the Virtual Reality for Social Good Initiative here at UF. So with that out of the way, it, let's get started. Uh, first, I want to pose a question to our panelists uh, that was often brought up to me when I was uh, working on the questions here, which is, it is ho often hard to grasp what AI can be compared to in this day and age, whether it's the internet, the printing press, or even the horse and buggy. So with that, I would like to get your thoughts on what can we as journalists and business uh, entrepreneurs compare it to? OK. Um, yeah, I think uh, I am also fascinated by this question. I think we're in a really pivotal moment right now where it's unclear what of those options I think we uh, that um, that AI is going to be right. I think we're we're sort of in a world where there are two paths in front of us. It could be one of two options or somewhere in the middle, to be honest. And I think the two options are either um, AI can become this force of good, right? It could be this tool that is used to complement work. It can maybe rebuild the middle class, right? There are um, a few economic studies looking at how um, when AI is used as a tool to help um, writers, it can actually um, help writers who are not that good, who are less skilled writers. It can help them be better writers. And so that's an exciting potential that could happen. There's also the potential that it could be more like the Industrial Revolution, where it really put artisans out of work. And so there are these two worlds that could exist, and maybe they'll coexist. And it's sort of an interesting moment to think about, um, can we help define where we go, right? Like, are there things that we can do now? Um, and so I think that's. Um, partly what interested me in having this as a topic here today, because I wanted to learn from, from, from these panelists and also from you all of like, what are the questions, but also um, where is the research going? So Jib, I want to pose to you a question, which uh, dealing with your research, how can we uh, decide how, what impacts does AI deliver us a general value? So I think that AI helps elevate a lot of people. There's a lot of research that indicates that AI helps people um, do a task better, regardless of their skill set. There's, for instance, a study from MIT that indicated that you know call center people that uh, you know are, had just joined a call center, you know when they use generative AI to answer calls, they actually perform much better, much quicker. Um, while that helped the people who were brand new, it didn't really help the people who were um, who had already been in that role. Another example is uh, there's a study that was in Nature in November of last year that, that talked about how uh, radiologists who are trying to detect breast cancer do a lot better when they work with an AI. And um, so they had two doctors who are radiologist specialists looking for detecting breast cancer based on the 
radiology results. And then they had a third reader that was an AI tool. And basically, the AI detected another one out of 1,000 people that it reviewed. And those one out of 1,000 were 83% had kind of an invasive condition that, you know, if not treated, would have been uh, uh, tragic. Um, I think AI is really good at, uh, at detecting patterns. Um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, actually having businesses do a lot better that way, including developing, like, computer code. So I'm working with a company right now, and this company actually is creating a front end to their database that, you know, automatically uh, the AI tool will write a SQL statement based on somebody typing in kind of a free text question that they want to know from the database. And then it will automatically return the answer even without somebody. Normally, that would have required somebody from IT to write that for them. Jess, I was hoping you could share with us a little bit. Uh, as part of your Planet Mo Money podcast, you talk, uh, You had an entire episode that was written by AI. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and tell us a little bit why, uh, in what cases did AI do better than the regular person or vice versa? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, we've done this a bunch at Planet Money where we really try and understand a tool by using it. Mm -hmm. And so um, when AI came out, we knew we wanted to do something interesting with it, and we were really trying to suss out how to do it. And we landed on, um, well, in part because there's this idea that uh, will AI sort of replace workers? And we thought, why not try us? And so we had... Um, uh, we had uh, uh, machine learning, different machine learning tools uh, help by first reading a 52-page uh, journal article in, uh, in economics that was all about, um, that was also about uh, replacing uh, human labor um, in a different front. And so then it was reading that article and then coming up with a list of questions. Um, we had humans ask the questions so that the, the um, Economists weren't freaked out by a machine asking questions, so we we did that um, by human with humans. But then the machine actually uh, picked what tape to to use, like what cuts to use. Um, picked like actually wrote the piece, even did sound design for it. So it even said, "Here's where you'd put music, and here's the kind of music you would do." Um, and so it was a real experience in seeing like what oh and then finally we uh used um audio like an archive of audio from one of our hosts who had been on the show for for about um 10 years or so and so the machine learned that person's voice and actually was trained on it and then we created a synthetic robert smith voice um, and it was amazing to watch the training. Um, we show it a little bit, or we describe it a little bit in the show. And it first sounds like a jumble of, of swarm of bees, like in someone's mouth talking, and you're like, this is terrible to listen to. And then by the end of it, there's still a hint of bee, but you, it's like actually sounds like Robert Smith. And we even played the synthetic Robert Smith to the real Robert Smith, and he was like, he, he got a kick out of it. Um, so anyway, we made an entire episode that was essentially um, made from AI, and I think the result was, um, and we played it for people, and I think the one of the funny responses was like, okay, I've, li I've listened to many first drafts in my time at Planet Money, and this was not actually that bad of a first draft, right? So it's like, it's a little bit terrifying because you're like, okay, it can write a good first draft. There are still terrible parts to it. Like if you listen to the show, um, there's laughter in it, like synthetic Robert Smith tries to laugh, and it's the creepiest thing you've ever heard. You're just like, no human should make that sound because it's not a human making that sound. So it's sort of this range of feeling both like, okay, like maybe it's it's okay we, that AI is here and it like it can't quite replace me yet. So uh, so I've got a couple of years um, left, but it is also like. It's not bad um, for for just being around for um, at that at that point it had been around for about six months, so um, yeah. So that's a little bit on that story. I think we've done other stories in the past where we've like sort of done a kind of human versus the machines, trying to figure out exactly what are machines good at that humans um, 
take, might take for granted. And so one example um, that I always remember is this idea that um, a lot of the things that we learn before age 10 are things that machines actually struggle with, right? So it's things like recognizing facial expressions, um, machines can actually be quite good at, whereas recognizing how to fold a piece of laundry, it has to figure out what is the corner? How do you bend the material? What is the material? What is the weight of the material? It's like all of these little cues that are hard to learn. Um, another example is like picking strawberries, right? This is something that I'm sure many children do, but a machine would find it difficult to be like, okay, how gently do you hold this? Like how, or how firmly do you have to pull on it? So it's, it's all sorts of things, yeah. But it's something we like to do at Planet Money is really test things out. So pivoting a little bit to the broader AI experience, uh, Shri, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how we can build a more effective, immersive experience, and is it even worth it to begin with? Um, OK, um, I'll start by answering the second part of the question. So um, I'll start by mentioning that um, it's absolutely worthwhile when we think about what value we bring in here. So what is that value, right? So when we are talking about something which can enhance the work that we do, but more importantly, creating something which we cannot normally experience, but which can be wrought about using a virtual experience, then it becomes very worthwhile. So uh, experience is the heart of any good virtual experience, any VR experience. So for the longest time, the belief was that it's a big empathy machine, right? Everybody and their second cousin three times removed would say that VR is this great empathy machine, but it really goes well beyond empathy. So when we talk about what makes it worthwhile, um, now we have some emerging research as well as emerging studies which show that VR goes beyond just creating empathy and generating empathy. It's also very useful when you think about it in terms of making sense. Right, so this has a lot of implications for big data, for AI experiences, so sense making is a huge component. Uh, the notion of the shared experience, so we know that the metaverse has taken a little bit of a, a hiatus right now, but uh, shared experiences are going to be the heart of the types of great effective virtual experience that we can build in the future. Finally, a term that we have coined where we talk about it in terms of what could be a worthwhile experience is looking at the notion of what we refer to as an accelerated future. Right, so for example, if you ask uh, or if you tell a teenage smoker saying the rate at which you're smoking 30 years down the line, you're going to get lung cancer, it's just not going to cut it. But using a very effective virtual experience, we can create a three minute module where we can accelerate your lifespan by around 30 years and then make it like truly effective to show how your body changes over time. So those would be some of the uh, ways in which it can be worthwhile in terms of building an effective ecosystem around this. Um, I think it starts with recognizing sometimes that there are certain experiences that it's not worth doing in virtual reality. So I think that's very important to know. Um, it's also important for us to realize that, um, you know, what is the amount of time that someone needs to spend in virtual reality? So I think that's a very key question. Venture capitalists and so many promoters, company promoters, think that we're going to be spending the rest of our lives behind these goggles and these headsets. Uh, that's not really true. So we are still not at that point where we can actually be completely immersed for more than 30 minutes to one, one hour effectively. So I think that's something that we need to recognize. Also importantly, building an effective ecosystem um, ensures or should ensure that we know what some of the capabilities and what the limitations of technology are, right? So right now we are still navigating fairly fresh waters here. So we are still looking at it in terms of what the size of the objects in virtual reality, what's the point of view, how does it affect our vision. So I think those are some of those questions which need to be answered in order to build an effective system. And just to follow up on that, what are some of the biggest barriers of entry for people as of this point? Is it financial? Is it just ease of access to these devices? Okay, great question. I think it's a combination of both. Um, so um, financially, Yes, um, although we've seen a lot of progress, I think we've seen more progress in this um, ecosystem in the last three years than in the previous 25 to 30 years combined. Um, but there's one vexing problem that this industry has faced, which is it's been very difficult to build and sustain those experiences. 
So that's that's one huge aspect. Um, the the second component is uh, it's become definitely a lot easier to build some of these things. Um, so now um, I've had uh, 10th graders come and do an internship in my lab, and then at the end of that internship, they've actually come up with fairly decent immersive experiences. So the barrier is sort of reducing. Um, access remains like a huge issue. Um, so um, uh, you know, you have certain devices which can only experience certain types of uh, immersive experiences, so there's no standardization, so that becomes like a big issue. And then the fact that so many of these technologies change, and then once those change, uh, because the point of view changes, the input device uh, mechanisms change, that's probably true of most technological platforms, but that's especially true in um, VR experiences. Because what then happens is you have a perfectly good experience and then it just gets abandoned. And that's been the case with so many great programs. So that's something which, um, you know, is definitely like a challenge that needs to be surmounted. All right, moving into the overall AI in the business sphere. Uh, Jim, can you talk a little bit about what is going to be necessary in order for businesses to have a return on their investment here? Yeah, um, right now. Right now, I think that there is a gold rush going on in terms of AI. Um, I've been working in this field for quite some time and, and doing more traditional AI and machine learning. And you know that involves a project team with a data scientist and data engineer, a lot of those kind of people. And you know before you would start a project that would require you to have that kind of team and that kind of horsepower doing your solving your business problem, you would have a very clear understanding of what you wanted to get out of that and how you were going to integrate it back in the business. Having said that, in November 2022, when they released ChatGPT broadly to uh, folks, the real issue is everyone wanted to get into the game and everybody was thinking of different ways to use it. Um, a lot of CEOs are making huge investments. Microsoft just said the other day it took them 10 years to get their cloud you know, business up to $10 billion, but in the last, since ChatGPT came out, they've added another $4 billion to their overall cloud business because of the AI tools. What I would say is a lot of CEOs, because of this gold rush, have not actually uh, thought about exactly what they want to get out of it. They've just said, go do something good, and they've spent a lot of money doing that. So I think one of the really important things going forward is for these CEOs to recognize that they have to specify, like, what is the purpose behind what we're trying to do with generative AI, and does it fit this business problem that I'm trying to solve? Uh, I also think another issue with this is that, um, you know, the, the technology is evolving so fast. I mean, I was just looking at a timeline of ChatGPT um, where they, it originally came out in, in uh, November of 2022, and then in March of 2023, they came out with version four. Um, I was teaching a class on how to use the uh, interface to ChatGPT, not the front end that you see you know, when you go to the web, but rather the one that the computer system would use to talk to ChatGPT. And you know, what's happened is they have changed that program so fast that the software developers can't keep up with um, actually the changes that are happening on, you know, the improvements that are being made. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the ChatGPT was seen as um, being lazy lately. They didn't exactly reveal why, but the answers coming back weren't that great. What if you had put all of this money into, you know, a solution that used that version of ChatGPT, and then all of a sudden it's not giving you good answers anymore? I just think that there's a lot of promise there, but they have to specify exactly, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Think about things that are likely to be around long enough for you to get your money back from all of your uh, time invested in doing the program. Great, and to follow up with that, I think uh, you touched on a really important thing, which is how can we get there to that uh, return on investment? I'd like to pose that question to both Jess and Shri as well. Um, Jess, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, 
It's an interesting question in part because as a journalist, I really work um, with the stories that people are sharing and what they actually are doing. And so I, in some ways, I feel more like a mirror reflecting back what I see actual companies do. Um, the th I think the main thing that I've been thinking about is I think the rules of the road are a little tricky right now, right? Um, in part in terms of, say, the rights issues and intellectual property rights um, for writers, for artists. Um, I think that's a huge question that makes it difficult, um, I think, to know exactly uh, where machine learning is and how it can progress um, and whether you can rely on it. So I think in some ways there's the, the rules that make it tricky. And then I think it's also, um, a scary time for a lot of artists in that way too and so I think there are many stories of people who don't want to their work to be included in this and like in what way can they prevent that in what way um, does it stymie things and so I think there there are just so many issues around it that I I think there's a role for um, government inter um, intervention. There's a role for institutions to have a say. There's a role for pri the private sector to kind of define what, what's going on. Um, and I think that's sort of what I mean by this is a pivotal moment, because it feels like we there's, there's work to be done to figure out exactly what path we can follow um, for this. And so, but yes, I'm, I'm intrigued by what, what everyone's been saying here in part because I feel like I learned so much by how it's actually being used and and so stories of how it's being used um, sort of spark ideas in my brain. Shri? Um, so, uh, th this is a question that I don't think we have a right answer to, but I think it's um, something that we can definitely speculate on and building off of some of the things that you said. I'm looking at it more from uh, the immersive ecosystem space. Um, I would like to think that once we see how these can be used in quotidian life, right? So everyday life and how it can really enhance our experiences. So that's where we'll see uh, the greatest uh, bang for the buck, so to say. Um, and we've seen this, the quest for the killer app and immersive that still is eternal, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of this happen at the industrial app level. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on. Uh, but looking at it in terms of going beyond the science, so if you want to try and sort of bifurcate between uh, the killer app being in the realm of science and technology and engineering, but then looking at it more in terms of uh, something which is more mystical, something which is more philosophical, um, that's something that we still haven't got there. And so that's where I think we can really enrich the panoply of human experiences. So that's one. Uh, the other important thing is, uh, Right now, we are still looking at most of these custom-made experiences which are sort of thrust down upon us. So the belief being that you can create something which is truly immersive and that is just something which is a great entertainment tool, uh, at least the level of the consumer. So I think once we start having more shared experiences where people are able to create these experiences, and so it becomes much more adaptive, and then they can share these with other people, and then there's this direct sharing of these experiences, that's where I think we'll see the greatest ROI as well. And to follow up on that, do you believe that any sort of oversight, both legally or ethically, is going to pose a real risk of stifling the creativity behind it? Um, so that's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, so uh, we've seen that with every new technology, that's, that's always the case, right? Uh, there's a great paper a long time ago that I read in grad school about why internet pornography should not be regulated, right? So uh, it came down from the time of uh, the Canterbury Tales and spoke about how every new development in the media world, uh, the, the pornography industry was at the forefront of it, however you define pornography, right? Um, so uh, there was that um, talk. So uh, in terms of regulation, I think there's a case to be made. I think we do need to have some regulation here. Uh, I'll give an example, and this is something which uh, we are all aware of when we speak about deep fakes. It's been pretty much in the news in the last couple of days, um, thanks to a very popular person being deep faked, right? Um, so you can just think about how staggering it can be when we are talking about it in terms of a 2D internet ecosystem, right? And that's scary enough. So when you see something like this, which could be virtualized, then it's, it's very, very difficult. Right, so um, at some level, there need to be 
there needs to be some semblance of regulation. Uh, we're also looking at it in terms of very vulnerable communities and populations. Um, so there needs to be that level of education which needs to happen too. But hopefully not to the cost of stifling that creativity which could also happen. But I'll turn it over to you. I think uh, one of the big worries about stifling innovation is how they actually trained a lot of the generative AI systems was that they scraped a lot of that information from the web. And you know some of that information, you know maybe we didn't want it to get out there, but companies have been doing that for quite some time. The reason that Google autocomplete works when you're uh, typing in something into Google and allows you to actually see you know, potential answers, I mean, that's been around for a long time. How did they get that? Well, Google was allowed to actually have access to websites to be able to get that data. Um, so, you know, the, the companies actually allowed them so that they could have their website come up first in a Google search. So this kind of issue with uh, restrictions, I think, is an important uh, question. There are companies, for instance, right now that are suing OpenAI about the fact that they use some of their data to train that AI. That's certainly um, a risk that might stifle innovation. I do think that OpenAI is actually partnering with some of the organizations that they originally scraped the data from and, and writing agreements to pay for that. So you know, we'll probably work our way around that in the end. I think. Because there's so much hype right now about this, I worry about disillusionment. I worry that you know CEOs who invest lots of money in this, uh, it will be you know, and then don't get a return on investment. They'll actually probably not end up, uh, you know, they'll, they'll not make those investments in the future. I worry also about you know the fact that creatives are worried about losing their job to AI. Uh, I personally believe that AI is actually only good if the very best people who are creative are actually the ones that input training data into the system. Um, I worry about hallucinations. Um, you know, if you don't know what hallucinations are in terms of generative AI, that's when the system returns an answer that's clearly wrong and that you can detect that it's wrong. And a lot of the systems are doing that. Uh, they did so more in the past, they're getting better about that now, and particularly they're getting better for some of the systems that are connected to the internet that can answer a question, you know, and give you the reference for it. However, I think hallucinations, if, you get a, if you're a customer and you get a hallucinated answer, you're probably going to feel like you were cheated out of something. Um, I also think bad data train, that's used for training is another potential area that you know, potentially could harm the implementation of AI. Um, so an example is the Apple credit card uh, that came out a few years ago. Um, they were actually sued because, you know, a husband and wife that were in the same family ended up, the wife got a lower credit, uh, you know, allowance than the husband did, even though they had shared accounts and the, there was no, no difference between them. And so, one of the state's uh, attorney generals actually sued them over that. And what, you know, it turned out that uh, what they found out was it was not a model problem in the AI. It was all about the data that was trained. The historical data about uh, women's income was different than men's income. And so that's a big issue now, too. How, how do we deal with the fact that the data that we train these AI systems from is perhaps not as biased? Yeah, I want to jump off of that a little bit because I feel like the story that I've definitely heard that I think many people have probably heard is um, the bias that can be in in these tools. And it's really about the data that, yeah. that trained it, right? So a famous example is um, that Amazon had a hiring, an AI hiring tool. It didn't, uh, I don't know if it actually, I don't believe it actually was in practice because they discovered this bias, which was basically because the data behind it was trained largely on successful um, men candidates and the part uh, the elements that made them successful were um, they talked about how they were leaders they they were very confident in either the writing or the resume and in these various ways um, and so the tool actually would uh, looked at resumes and if if it was a candidate who's a woman or a candidate, say, um, 
who came from a uh, women's college, it actually uh, dinged them lower. So it really surfaced male candidates. That's an example where like the AI itself, is the, is the AI itself problem, problematic? No, but the data behind it was, or maybe it's the bias of the previous um, regime, right? pre-AI, but it's a way in which AI could perpetuate bias um, that sort of, I think, is something that we really need to watch out for. And I think that's one of journalism's um, role in this is really looking at those examples and really highlighting, um, sharing stories that, that resonate with people. Um, so that's something that I definitely uh, think about. And um, I think another risk that I've been thinking a lot about, especially being on campus um, and hearing from a lot of students and their questions, it's in part like, will, um, will AI take my job and mean that I don't have the job that I have been studying for over the last four years or whatever the case might be? Um, and I, that's a really hard one for me to answer, and I've been really struggling with it for what, uh, while I've been here. Um, and part of it is like I really understand that fear. I've been telling people here that when I graduated, I graduated into the um, the housing crisis, right? The uh, global financial crisis, and that was a terrifying time to be graduating, um, especially as an econ major and thinking like the basis of of a lot that you're learning is is sort of falling apart. Um, and so I think there's there's worry of like overhyping those risks, right? And like I think there are ways in which the economy had to rebuild and had to re really think about the foundational things um, that were problematic. Uh, so that that did need to happen, but in the same way, like the economy did still keep going. There are still jobs. Um, there's an episode uh, that uh, Planet Money did, um, I think about a year ago now with the economist David Otter from MIT. And one of the hosts um, of Planet Money was talking with him. And he was basically like, yes, there is a version of, of um, AI that could be really terrible. And, and it can be really terrible for some of the reasons Sri was also talking about earlier of just like, um, uh, so there could be many reasons could be terrible for human existence. But in terms of jobs and the economy, I think it could have, um, there's a world in which it is better, we are better off, right? Because humans, they're like, especially in the US, we're a country that um, has, uh, has decreasing um, uh, birth rates, there's uh, less immigration over time. And so in these two ways, there's, there are jobs to be had because there's still work to be done. And so in that way, there, we can sort of take a breath and think about um, that and not overhype the dangers too much. So to follow up on that, do you think there are any uh, industries that come to mind that would really benefit from this over others? Um, sure. I mean, there's a range of industries uh, that I can think of. Um, just some examples, um, healthcare. So we talk about the three T's, um, treatment, therapy, and training. So you can have all those, and that's, that's one of the first uh, great application, industrial applications of ER, you know, where you had uh, gallbladder surgery application in Stanford way back in the day, around 30 years ago. So that sort of set the stone for how this could be used in healthcare settings. Um, just about anything that you see in terms of any vehicle which you've been using for the last several years now, um, has almost certainly gone through like some mixed reality, some immersive reality simulation. Um, so it's uh, very um, highly effective and um, in, in industry. Uh, the construction and power industry, for example, um, one of my collaborators works with a power company in Brazil, and they're just creating all these so-called digital twins and these immersive experiences to look at those. Um, so it's a range of industries that could benefit, um, but also you know coming down to uh, journalism, right? Since we were talking about business and journalism here. Um, so there's a range of industries which we look at as what we refer to as decision-making under duress. So anytime you have like a pressure cooker situation, uh, a lot of times we are not able to teach people exactly how to respond in those situations. You know, how do you take a young reporter who's just graduated 
and this person is in Syria or uh, Iraq or some place, and then the bullets are flying around, how do you teach them to report, right? But you can create these very effective experiences where you can do some of those things. So these would be some of the examples, but really the range of industries that can benefit from this is just growing exponentially. So we're just about ready to open up the Q&A, but before we do, I want to pose one final question to all of you, which is, where do you see the future of AI going? I think I'll start only because I feel like I don't have a great answer, and I think it's because I don't know where it's going, right? Like, in, like I said before, I do think of myself as sort of more of a mirror, um, and so it's sort of depending on where it goes, like that is what we report and what and the stories we tell. And so I don't, I don't really have an answer. I hope for the good scenario, right? The one where AI is a tool that helps people, that helps doctors, or there's also a world in which it can help um, middle uh, skill workers uh, be able to, to earn more of an income and really rebuild the middle class. So that, that's my hope, but I, I don't know if I can answer where I think it's going. I, I think that um, there's a lot of research indicating that AI plus humans are better than humans and they're better than AI alone. And so, I mean, we have so many areas in the university that right now are using AI in ways that weren't anticipated five years ago. An example is we have uh, researchers that we hired in the arts who are using uh, computer vision with video to actually track movement of dancers when they're uh, doing a dance. They can also identify new moves that had not yet been done. That's combining the creative with this kind of new capability to, to create, but it's human plus AIs. Uh, I also think that currently we're in the infancy stages of the implementation of AI, and I think that um, you know, ChatGPT version 3.5 or 4.0 is not as good as ChatGPT version 20 is gonna be. I think version 20 is going to have a lot more capabilities, and it's really up to us and the companies and the, and the creatives to figure out how best to use this tool. I am more, um, uh, I believe that it's going to uh, help us more than hurt us. It has the potential to hurt us, but I definitely think that uh, the future is bright. Okay, very quickly. So um, it's certainly something that I'm excited about, the tremendous possibilities. I mean, I don't think we know where we are headed, but the intersection of AI and immersive could lead to what I believe will be very highly customized, tailored experiences. So these could be uh, looking at all the different considerations of culture, uh, be bias-free. So it could be something which could be ideally uh, something which could work very well. Um, so just to give you a very quick example, um, we asked um, um, ChatGPT to design uh, like, a, like a virtual reality code and experience for a student who might be suffering from ADHD and the type of experience it would design uh, to explain Newton's laws, right? And it came up with every single thing, right? Including how do you download the software and here's how you go about it and here's the source code. So we don't even need to be saving these things, right? So we could just ask these questions. So it could be a game changer in some of those ways. So, um, you know, this, uh, this potential for highly customized, tailored experiences is something that I'm pretty excited about. Fingers crossed. All right, with that, uh, I believe we are going to be passing around a microphone. Uh, so if anyone has a question, uh, the panelists are open to it. OK. Hi, my name is Abby. I have a question for Jess. Do you see yourself utilizing and supervising AI tools in your work on a daily basis? And the second part of that question is, what would you recommend to other journalists in terms of familiarizing themselves with AI tools right now to use in their work? Um, okay, I, I don't know if I see a, exactly see a future where I'm advising people who are using it. Um, I will say though, my supervisor as a suggestion for me, if um, I'm struggling uh, telling a story or, or struggling um, advising someone else was basically uh, suggested that 
we could use uh, ChatGBT. I'll back up a little. So basically with Planet Money, there are two key parts that we're always looking for in a story, one of which is the narrative, right? Like a person in a place doing a thing. And then the other side is meaning, right? What is the economic learning um, from that, that a listener will leave the episode with? And so we often have the narrative side, the economic learning side can be quite tough where you're like, this is a really fascinating story, but what does it mean? And so we don't always have the answer to that. And so um, his suggestion was like, if someone is struggling with that, what if we put the story into ChatGPT and see what they think the economic answer is? Um, I have not yet done it, which I think is a sign of my like a trepidation with it because it is a moment where I'm like, ooh, is this replacing me? Because like part of my skill is I have an econ major. I can think about, oh, what does this mean? I can like pull out parts of the story and ask the reporter, oh, can we slow this down and really unpack this part? Um, and so maybe it's actually a sign of like how fearful I am of this, right? That I am hesitant to suggest that because it's literally telling a direct report, you can replace me with ChatGPT. Um, so yeah, so I think that sort of explains at least the first half of your question and remind me what the second half of your question was. I think it's useful. It's definitely useful. And I would say probably more so for people newer in their careers, right? That it's, this is a tool and it's worth learning in part because I think we're using it, like it, it's out there, right? Like it's happening whether you want it to happen or not. And so maybe this is a sign that when I go home tonight that I need to, to like really crack down and figure out uh, how, I, how do I work better with this tool and not be so afraid of it, but yeah. All right, next question. So it seems like in the last year, every like investment, uh, public or private, that's mentioned AI has done tremendously well. And if you just take like the main leaders, like in the public markets, um, their market caps combined outweigh entire countries, right? So do you think people have gotten, or do you fear that people have gotten a little ahead of themselves in um, how valuable they think the future benefits of AI are going to be. Um, and do you think we're kind of in like a similar situation to a dot-com bubble where there might be a big setback in the near future before long-term progress can be made? Yeah, I think that, that uh, I was using the word gold rush or hype. Uh, I'm really worried about disillusionment of our business leaders, not the ones that at the IT companies, but the business leaders that are you know, responsible for turning these uh, tools into ideas that generate revenue. And so I do worry that uh, because there's been so much money, in, in fact, diverted from other projects to go into that, that I am worried that if they didn't specify kind of what the outcome that they expected to achieve was, that they're definitely probably not going to achieve something and therefore, um, I am worried about a bubble. I do think that in the long run, uh, it will actually improve. We went through a, the internet bubble in the early 2000s when, you know, when the dot-com burst, but IT is, is going really strong right now. I, I would just not, for the long run, I wouldn't be worried about it, but in the short run, in the next 18 months, I am worried about it. Uh, I believe we have a question coming in from online, so Eric. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's right. This person asks uh, a student, I imagine, uh, what careers will be most impacted by AI? Uh, a specific, specifically, how many of us will be rendered obsolete the minute we graduate? Mm -hmm. uh, but also conversely, what careers do you think will thrive? So there are brand new roles that are out there. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about the hottest, our new job, which is this uh, chief AI officer at firms, uh, I think that um, there are a lot of people, there's a new role for um, a prompt engineer. Um, all of those are kind of areas that didn't exist 18 months ago. And I, I think that if you understand how to use AI, even no matter what field you're in, that you will be more valuable if you understand how to use it. Back to the journalism question, we were talking about it before we came down here, and I think, um, 
it's possible for you to get a head start if you're brand new in a field um, by, for instance, putting in the facts and asking it to take the perspective of a reporter and get the answer out. Um, it's never going to, right now anyway, it's not, it's not going to be something you want to turn into your boss. It's something that gives you an outline and a start that maybe shaves three or four or five hours off of your effort to be able to turn something in that's really meaningful. And you will have to add that, and you will add it from what your experience is here at school. I, I do think that coding, there are a lot of people being laid off right now at the big IT companies who are coders. Uh, I think partially that's because they're trying, they, they hired too many people during the pandemic, but I also think that it's because some CEOs have thought that they are going to replace people. I think that too is going to be a bubble that bursts, which is without those people and the creatives, you're not going to get the value that you expect. And you'll see rehiring 18 months later at those big IT companies. Shri, do you have anything to add through that, uh, your virtual reality lens? So, um, I I see the greatest benefit for incorporating immersive experiences, like I said, in just about any sphere, in terms of where it can serve as a complement or a supplement to what we already do. So I think it's um, it's rather futile and rather pointless at this point in time to think about it replacing like an entire industry. But I think what it can really do is to help us become better people, and we can explicate what we mean by better people in many ways, but I think it can really help us become better humans, right? And so that's where I'm pretty bullish on why this can work. It comes down to one simple thing, you know, even when we um, translate this into the world of business and industry and um, occupations. So the human brain is just not designed to empathize with something that it cannot experience. That's what it comes down to, bottom line. So anytime you can create an experience which you normally wouldn't be able to have, right? So how would I feel? Um, you know, you can ask someone, what does it feel like to be homeless, right? And you can be the kindest, nicest person, um, but you can sympathize, you cannot truly empathize. But I can create a very effective experience and then I can actually make you go through that. So I would like to think that um, this is something which can actually help us um, I think there was a study, I think we spoke about this just last week on Zoom. Uh, there was a study in uh, uh, Nature just last week, or it might have been Science, uh, about how um, you know this helps, um, uh, I think uh, an immersive agent helps uh, with better bedside manners with patients than the actual human, right? So it's a combination of AI and an immersive system. So I don't think this is necessarily going to replace it, because some of the things that you mentioned in terms of when it can be more effective, but can certainly help uh, the human doctor, for example, become a better doctor. So I think it can be used as a very good aid or enhancer. Jess, do you have something you want to add? Um, I think the only thing to add really is the, the maybe um, a silly quip of like, you don't actually know whether it's a bubble or not until it's burst, right? And so I think it's it's too early to tell, which is somewhat of a terrible uh, answer for some people in this room right now. But I do think it's um, it's something that it it is where we we just don't know yet, and so we'll we'll find out um, over the the next few years. All right, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So, how much of the danger? of AI generated, say, video and audio, basically the deep, deep fakes that we told are, are not that the, uh, the generated stuff might be mistaken for real, but more that it casts doubt that the real stuff isn't fake. So in other words, you know, AI Robert Smith, you know, can, oh, you can tell that, you know, he does a fake podcast, you can tell oh, that's fake. But now how much does that cast doubt on all the stuff that the real Robert Smith says, assuming the AI Robert Smith doesn't laugh and give itself away, but um, he, he, extending all the way to video evidence in stories and in jury trials and in everything, where you know you have somebody just claim, oh, you know, a anything that's presented against them is, oh, I'm sorry, that was just AI generated, right? How do you prove it wasn't? 
I think that's a really good question. Like, um, there is definitely this woman I follow on Instagram, and she basically uh, presents six photos, and uh, five of them are AI, and one of them is real. And it's really disturbing when I can't figure out which one is is the real one. And I think it does. I like then. Uh, in, before she reveals which one it is, I have a story in my head of how each one is AI. Um, and so I think you're entirely right. And I think it's a sign in the episode, we had to explain that at the end of the series, we um, buried synthetic Robert out in the back, right? So we made it clear that synthetic Robert was only pulled out for this series. And I think it's for that reason, right? Of, of wanting to uh, hopefully make sure people uh, remember that we, we we don't use AI like this on the normal basis. This is really just an experiment in its case. So I think you, you pose very good uh, question that I, I don't have an answer to, but I, I feel like Jim might. So I think this is an area of research that I think uh, companies are trying to struggle to catch up with this being a problem, right? I think uh, one area that may help is if there were and I'm not a big blockchain fan, but if you could blockchain proof that something was real versus not real and embed that into real videos that you could track back that certified that that was something real, that's an area as an example of how, you know, there's probably some company out there figuring that out right now because it's important. All right, I think we've got time for one last question, Eric. We got one up here. So this is a question that might not necessarily even be applicable to AI, just any new technology in the current world we live in. Um, I think most technologies like um, automation of telephones is good for the global economy, although it might be bad for a few specific people. But I think most innovations are overall good for the economy. And I think that's probably the same way with AI. Um, however, I also think that more and more often the innovations are for demand development and not actually like innovation or improvement of a product. Um, so what are your thoughts on that, basically? We talked about, we talked about before the idea that, um, you know, there were risks with a lot of other technologies implementing, right? I mean, the risk of the printing press, I mean, there were people that were really worried that, you know, the ability for all of us to be able to have all that knowledge is dangerous. Um, it was dangerous. I mean, the Unabomber wrote his uh, manifesto on a document, right? But I think that we have, as people, have figured out how to accept that there is some danger with any new technology and figured out kind of what the bounds are on that. Yeah, the example that I'm thinking of, um, in part because we've done a few episodes on it, is like with textiles, right? The Luddites really were hurt in the process, and they recognized the problem, and they fought back at the time um, in in a very um, bloody way, but they did fight back. Um, and so I think it's just, I think you're totally right to say that, that there's a world in which some people are hurt, um, but like I don't buy... Uh, homemade, home like loomed uh, goods because it would be far too expensive. Um, and so I think it has made society in some ways better off that you could buy machine made clothing. And, and so, um, and I think a lot of the growth of society relied on it. Um, it's not to say that the, the Luddites weren't hurt in the process, but it, it is. Um, it is somewhat figuring out how do you help the Luddites so that they're not um, kind of in this world of not having a job, not having a future, and not seeing how how to change that. And so I think that's partly what I find interesting is, is how do you move on from that moment? Because I think AI is going to be disruptive, right? It can't, it can't um, exist without being disruptive. But it's, it's how do you mitigate that disruption that I think um, there are economists who are thinking about it. I think a lot of businesses that are thinking about it, too. All right. Well, I want to thank the entire panel once again and everybody for participating in the q and I'm going to pass it back, oh, back over to Matt to close us off.
Thanks, Brett, and, and thank you, everyone, for the wonderful uh, discussion here. I want to uh, close with a, a couple of um, comments just to try to tie together some things to, to sort of give you a sense of the range and breadth of the opportunity and challenges that AI represents, and th these will pull on some of the themes that were discussed. One is um, the training database, right? How bias isn't necessarily always intentional. So if we look at facial recognition software, where this, there's a lot of work that's been done on facial recognition software, we know that the greatest inaccuracy are lower socioeconomic women, urban women of color. That's where facial recognition software is least accurate. That's not built into the system by someone saying, I want this population or this demographic to be the most harmed by this. Think about what the training database is for that. The training databases, the most commonly used for facial recognition software, are driver's license photos and passport photos. Who are the least likely people to have driver's license photos and passport photos? Lower socioeconomic urban women of color, right? And so that's a bias that's built into a training data set that has nothing to do with somebody saying, I want to create a highly biased, highly inaccurate system. And error rates, by the way, they're improving some, but in facial recognition for that demographic, they approach 40% error rates as opposed to less than 10% for white males, right? So that just gives you a basic line there. On the other end, though, let's think about something that, where there's a real positive, go back to healthcare, which Sri mentioned, for example, vaccine development. Before you get to clinical trials, one of the biggest challenges in vaccine development is figuring out what are drug-to-drug -drug interactions, right? And so there are thousands of potential drug-to-drug -drug interactions. If you can AI that down to identifying the 100 or less most significant that actually have to be tested, and AI can do that in a matter of days when that used to take perhaps as many as seven, eight, nine, or 10 years to go through those kinds of things and focus then the researchers' efforts on something very narrow, testing 50, 60, 70 possibilities as opposed to testing thousands of possibilities, right? But then we go to another end of the spectrum. What about defense companies using AI to build AI-enabled weapon systems that are then, you know, through manufacturing and advances that then become very, very cheap and are then accessible by non-state actors to do a variety of things, right? So those kinds of things just represent the depth of the challenges of, and opportunities of AI not just as the businesses themselves in, in investing in those spaces, but the interaction to build business with public policy, civic engagement, the deep fake question, all of those kinds of things. The last thing I'll do is make a plug for um, the life of a t-shirt. Great, great five-part series. I use it in my class all the time. I, I had forgotten that, that not that Planet Money did it, but that you individually were involved in that, Jess. It's a fantastic, uh, again, each episode is about three to four minutes long. Uh, of that. It's absolutely abs uh, excellent. A wonderful, wonderful five-part series if you want to understand the life of a t-shirt and globalization. Um, lastly, there is a reception upstairs in the O'Neill Reading Room, which is back behind you on the second floor. There's a stairwell back here or elevator back in this corner if you wish to go up and mingle with our, our panelists and, and with our moderator. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you've enjoyed the program.